Hi, this is Paul. I've been trying to figure out how to interact with the Jordan Peterson Exodus seminar, and I have I did a little tweeting on Saturday morning. Um, I had listened to episode four, and I just put a link to it, um, or put a link to the little uh, teaser that Jordan put out on his channel. Um, it, I thought I, I thought Exodus I thought episode four was excellent. They've I've really enjoyed the conversation that they've been having, but I've been trying to figure out how to engage with it on my channel to the degree that I can. And I've had some I've had some correspondence back and forth with someone from Daily Wire to try and figure this out. It, it became obvious that the person that I was corresponding with didn't have any familiarity with what I had done with his first series that was on YouTube. And so then I wrote a little tweet. I still haven't figured out how to engage with this material via videos. Fair use remains a struggle in the video world. And, and this is often an issue with YouTube that um, fair use is written for print media and the guidelines are fairly obvious. Um, on the video world, often when we're using material, I think it's very much fair use, but YouTube may or may not allow it to stand and anyone who owns the content can sort of pull it down off of YouTube. And so I was I was sort of weighing that. And so I, I made that tweet and um, I'll figure something out eventually, basically said. And then Jordan retweeted my tweet and said, use it as you see fit, Paul Vanderclay. So I guess I have permission to use it as I see fit, which is really on Jordan's part a, a very... Um, really a very generous thing. Uh, I very much appreciate him giving me permission to use it. Now, as I use it, I intend to use it in a way that is very much in keeping with fair use. I intend to use it in a way that doesn't in any way, hopefully, harm Daily Wire's uh, commercial interests in it. I, I don't think it's a bad thing that it's behind the paywall. Obviously, I would love it if it wasn't. But Daily Wire hosted the seminar, they paid all the airfare, they paid the lodging, they paid the food, and they had all of these people there for eight days. Um, it's a commercial interest, and you know it's, it's fair that they have a way to recoup that commercial interest. So, so I will try and engage with it in a way that is within fair use and doesn't jeopardize their commercial interest, but at the same time affords the kind of commentary that I'd like to do with it. So my plan is to not use a lot of video in terms of the commentary because most of the content is actually audio. As you can see, as I put up on the screen here, most of the video, if you have the series, is just pictures of them talking. That's that's what a seminar is. And so really a lot of the, the value is in the audio commentary. And I want to, in this first video, talk a little bit about what the individual said in terms of why they participated in this. I don't know that the main value of the seminar is necessarily all of the insights. In, all the insights are fine, they're good, and there, there's certainly a lot of value in there, but it's, I think, in many ways, an exposition of how the Bible continues to shape our world and for many of the introductions, that was the focus. Hello, everyone. I have the great privilege today of opening an, a seminar on Exodus, an eight-part seminar, as many of you know. And so eight parts, four are out, four are coming. They're releasing them about every Friday. Some of you don't. I did a lecture series on Genesis in the fall of 2017, walking through that old book, and that had a reasonable impact, I would say, for that sort of venture. It was popular publicly. I think it had more than a reasonable impact. Now, it's hard for people to recognize that using the Bible and commenting on the Bible is an enormous thing. For many of you who don't go to church, you might not see a lot of Bible usage in the world. But for those who do go to church, it's got an enormous impact. And so actually, I'm really looking forward to his, his uh, Logos and Literacy series. Uh, the theater I rented sold out 16 times in a row, and then millions of people have watched it online. And that's really been something. And I'd had a dream after doing that, well, and before as well, that I would be able to walk through the entire corpus of the Bible over the course of my life. 
that's a very ambitious thing. I, I really want to see him do it. The Bible is a very big book. The Bible is a very old book. And the Bible has sections in the book that are very demanding of people. Well, as, a, as a preacher, so this week I, I was in Isaiah. It's, it's challenging to take little snippets of the Bible and help people understand how they all fit in. Um, as one saying goes, the Bible um, might be written for us, but it wasn't written to us. And so there's a great amount of challenge in figuring out, well, how does this all actually fit together? But the next step is Exodus. And I've been looking forward to that for a very long time. Remember, it was fall of 2017 when he started this thing. And so it has been a long time. It's where, you know, this is this is five years. And I thought before I did the public lecture series, because that's not what this is, that I would find a variety of scholars from around the world if I could and and see if I could figure out a way to bring them together to talk about Exodus in detail to help me fill in my knowledge of this book before I do a public lecture series on Exodus, which I plan to do in June of 2023. So that's really helpful. So the seminar is there to contribute to this. And in January, he's going to do it again, basically. And I'm very much looking forward to the second half of the book of Exodus, because as I've said many times, as a minister, uh, people say, oh, I want to read the Bible. All right, well, then they'll open the Bible like they open any other book, and they start with Genesis, and they read through Genesis, and wow, what stories. And then Exodus, oh, more great stories. And then they hit the this climax on Sinai with the Ten Commandments, and then there's more laws, and then there's the outfitting of the tabernacle, and then all of their motivation for reading their way through the Bible sort of plummets. Those of you who are familiar with church and Christianity will know that there are a lot of different plans out there. You can just Google this if you want to read through the whole Bible in one year. There are a lot of tools available to help people do that. Um, it's, a, it's a fun exercise, but if you take up that challenge, you will very quickly realize that the Bible is a very big book, and there are many strange parts of the Bible that don't necessarily grab people right away. And so I've brought together some of the sharpest and most interesting and deepest people that I've had the good fortune to meet in the last decade or so. Now, there's, a, there's been a fair amount of chatter about the selection of these individuals. I think it's been successful. Now, why do I say that? A lot of people said, well, why aren't there any biblical scholars? There are two theologians who... Um, at least when I looked at their CVs, their focus isn't on biblical scholarship. When I talked about Dennis Prager with some of my Jewish friends, he said, he's, this, guy is a, this guy is for evangelicals. He's a Jewish commentator for evangelicals, and fair enough. Uh, Stephen Blackwood is trying to revivify the university. Jonathan Peugeot is an icon carver who everyone here is familiar with. Oz Guinness is a very interesting individual who's had a, a long career um, writing books, being a social critic, and uh, he was at Labrie. Um, some of the people that I've, I've gotten to know through this journey have no Oz Guinness from the Labrie years. Dennis Prager and Oz Guinness are in some ways the culture warriors, the I would say the Cold War culture warriors of the crew. And it's, it's nice that there is a, I, I suspect Peugeot is the youngest there, and it's nice that they do have a degree of age diversity there because Oz Guinness and Dennis Prager are in some ways coming at this from similar seats, except, of course, Prager is coming at it with more of a Jewish voice and Guinness with more of an evangelical voice. And they've all graciously agreed to come here to Miami and to spend eight days concentrating on this book. And, and eight days is no small amount of time for some of these individuals. And under the auspices of the Daily Wire Plus group, who've flown them in and who are producing this and editing it and have done everything they can to make this possible and beautiful and as available as it might be. And, and that's, you know, again, I think that's 
as justification for the paywall, basically. If the public lectures, I suspect, might be more along the style of his YouTube channel. We'll have to see what they do with that. But that's June. So this is the first half of Exodus, and then the second half they want to get through in January. And again, I'm very interested in that because... So much of this, as I said when I started this, so much of this question about the seminar isn't just on the little tidbits of insight that they get along the way or the little applications. It's about the bigger questions of what is the role, what can the role of the Bible be for our society moving forward? And as we get into the introductions that a lot of these individuals give, that, in fact, seems to be their motivation for participation. So this material, or much of it, will be behind the Daily Wire paywall. We'll have a free-flowing discussion. I'm going to read the text, and I'm going to say what I have to say about it, and hopefully not too much for me, and I'm going to let the gentlemen that are with me have their say, and hopefully we're all going to learn an awful lot about this ancient story and what it means and why it's significant today and... Um, and why it's been significant for several thousand years. And so, and part of what's difficult about something like this is there's so much packed into it. And what he said right there, I think, is really key for understanding what Jordan is doing with the Bible. Well, I'll get everybody, first of all, to interview about it, and hopefully not too much for me. And I'm going to let the gentlemen that are with me have their say. And hopefully we're all going to learn an awful lot about this ancient story and what it means and why it's significant today and um, and why it's been significant for several thousand years. Right there. What it means, why it's significant today, and why it's been significant for several thousand years. And I think that was, in many ways, the significance of the Genesis, Genesis series. And I think that is the significance of this Exodus series. And I think for that reason, not having someone, let's say, who is whose focus is on biblical scholarship is not a bad thing. I want to do I'm gonna use the I'm gonna use the cosmic skeptic video a little bit a little bit more, uh, the cosmic skeptic critique of Jordan Peterson a little bit more because I think central to this is the question of the questions that he just laid out. How does the Bible work in our world today? In, in many ways, one way of understanding the Protestant Reformation is that conversation. And so I think it very much impacts this. And so I'll get everybody, first of all, to introduce themselves. And I'm going to start with Dr. Douglas Headley on my left. And we'll go around this way. And Now, people watching it so far, let's see if I can find a shot of Headley. Um, People watching it so far have really commented. There he is. Um, have really commented on Headley and his voice. <laughs> He's got. Um, uh oh, I think that might be my car. So Headley's got a great voice for this, and well, let's just listen to his introduction because their introductions are actually pretty key in terms, again, of how they see the importance of this camera, right? Dr. Headley? Well, my name is uh, Douglas Headley, and I'm a fellow at the... His, his title is uh, 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 Philosophy of Religion. So again, not biblical studies. The University of Cambridge, a fellow of Clare College, and I teach the philosophy of religion. And I think there's a crisis in our culture, and the crisis is linked to a certain ignorance of the very backbone of our own culture. And the Bible is very much at the core of our cultural inheritance. At the Temple of Apollo in Delphi, there was an inscription, Know Thyself, and we're in danger of not being able to know ourselves because of the ignorance of the very foundations of our culture. So that's one reason why I'm particularly fascinated by Dr. Peterson's endeavors in the last few years and intrigued by the developments um, 
in the next few days. And again, I think the fact that he is a professor of the philosophy of religion, this focuses in a little bit more sharply on exactly what is happening in the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. How is he making a contribution and where? I warmed to your invitation because I was born in China and I was a seven-year-old in the Chinese Revolution. This is, this is Oz Guinness. Now, there's a pretty substantial Wikipedia page for Guinness, born September 30, 1941, in Sangcheng, China, to medical missionaries working there. Um, Guinness is of Irish descent and the great, great, great grandson of Arthur Guinness, the Dublin brewer. So if you're drinking anything with a Guinness um, name on it, that's his family. He returned to England in 1951 for secondary school and eventually college. Guinness received a Bachelor of Divinity degree honors from the Uni University of London, 1966, Doctor of Philosophy from Oriel College, Oxford, 1981, where he studied under Peter Berger. Um, Peter Berger, not an unimportant person in terms of questions about religion and the world today. 1960s, Guinness was a leader at Labrie in Switzerland and after Oxford as a freelance reporter for the BBC. 1984, Guinness went to the United States and became the first fellow of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Oh, is that Princeton? Nope. And later, a visiting fellow of the Brookings Institute. From, from 86 to 89, Guinness served as executive director of Williamsburg Charter Foundation and was leading, was leading drafter of the Williamsburg Charter, a bicentennial clarification and reaffirmation of the religious liberty clauses of the First Amendment. He co-authored a public school curriculum called Living with Our Deepest Differences. In 1991, along with Alonzo McDonald, he arrived, he founded the Trinity Forum and served as senior fellow until 2004. Since then, he's been a senior fellow at the East West Institute in New York is and currently a senior fellow at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. So little, and he's got a good number of books under his belt. Um, I have read of his books, let's see, not a lot of his books. Um, I've, I've read a few of them. And when I was later an Oxford student, I had dinner with Sir Isaiah Berlin, the great Jewish philosopher. And as it turned out, he'd been a seven-year-old in the Russian Revolution. And comparing notes on it, we were saying what the revolutions meant, but the lack of people today understanding them. And for me, Exodus, obviously a classic in its own right politically, the birth of a great nation and people. But many people don't realize this is behind the English Revolution and also behind the American Revolution. And to understand that throws an incredible light on the present crisis, because as I see, you've got a basic clash between ideas coming down from the American Revolution, 1776, which came from the Torah, and ideas which come down from the French Revolution and its heirs. And so we've got a profound crisis, and many people don't understand the roots of it on either side. So what you're doing, I think, is immensely significant. So, so again, Guinness, um, one of the, one of the well, not, not technically a boomer, 1941, sort of a late builder on the cusp of being a builder and a boomer, um, roots in the culture war, roots in the Cold War. Uh, he's, he's kind of a storyteller throughout this, and, and that's really his contribution. And um... Dr. Orr, James Orr. My name is James Orr. I'm the Assistant Professor in Philosophy of Religion at the University of Cambridge, uh, where I teach uh, philosophy of religion and moral philosophy, theological ethics. And uh, much of that work focuses on what you might call the Hellenic, that is to say, the, the fountain of Western wisdom in Greek philosophy. But too often, I think we neglect the Hebraic, that is to say, the contribution to Western thought of the great Hebraic sources, and most of all, of course, the Torah, the Pentateuch. Uh, it's thrilling to be able to sit around and talk with uh, these distinguished friends and with you, Dr. Peterson, about, about the book of Exodus. Um, 
as Oz was saying, it has enormous significance historically, the English Revolution, the American Revolution, and, and more recently, many of the sort of liberation narratives that we're familiar with in the contemporary, uh, from the contemporary political landscape and contemporary debates. Uh, so I'm fascinated to, to be talking about these issues, particularly when we get to talking about uh, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the significance of this extraordinary claim, almost without precedent, that morality is given not and discovered and not simply invented and constructed. Uh, and that's one of, I think, many, many vital themes to our age that we'll be exploring productively in the days ahead, I hope. Now, now James Orr, too, particularly in the second episode, he'll, he'll engage in some, in a, some areas. There's one part of the second episode I really want to dig into. He'll engage in some areas that I think are, are really helpful because there's, as I talked about in the marriage crisis videos, there, there's currently sort of a fascination with evolutionary psychology, and that bears a lot more thinking about because how much can evolutionary psychology tell us about morality? This is part of the is ought problem with with science and and or will tend to jump in on some of those issues. What, what's interesting about the seminar is that as the seminar progresses, you can slowly get to know each of these individuals by the types of points they tend to either make or push back on. And, and one of the real blessings of this seminar is that it flows as well as it does. You might think with all of these individuals around the table, they they would sort of auger down into little disputes here and there, but they don't. It flows very well. Now, it doesn't appear to me to be heavily edited. For the most part, the conversation flows and it flows very well. And I know some people on Twitter have been sort of putting their list of people they would have liked to have seen around the table. But I think the fact that all of these people are people that at one level or another have... Um, have a relationship with Jordan, and there's a relationship of trust between them. And I think the time that they spent helped them have a relationship of trust between each other. And that goes a long way to making this a really valuable thing to listen to. Dennis Prager, welcome. Dr. Peterson and all of you, it's a joy to be with you. Uh, I am living my dream in my life being here. Now, now, Prager for me was someone that I kind of thought, oh, he's in the Daily Wire, you know, fold. How much is he really going to offer? And and again, he, like Guinness, is an older individual. Guinness is 81. Dennis Prager, Prager is 74. I really enjoy Prager during this thing. He's fun to listen to. He's got great little quips and anecdotes. In the first episode, he and Guinness talk a lot. I think um, Prager probably talks the most, followed by Guinness, followed by Jonathan Peugeot in the first episode. The next episode tends to balance out a little bit more, you know, with six and then obviously with, um, with Greg Hurwitz coming in episode two. You've got a lot of people around the table, and you might think, well, two hours. Well, two hours isn't that much time for many of these people that are good with words. So Dennis Prager, he's, he's, he, gets his, he gets his time in, but he's fun. He's got a lot of good anecdotes. He's got a lot of personal stories, very engaging. Now, part of this, of course, is he's, a ra he's already a radio and media personality. But the, the points I brought, the points he brought in, I thought were excellent. And, you know, he, for me, was, was one of the big surprises of this. He will also tend to bring in more uh, culture war type points, but usually with good humor and with a degree of deference. And yeah, he, Prager was a lot of fun in this. And, and, and Prager, as he says, he says he, he reads... He reads the Bible in Hebrew, the Torah in Hebrew, and um, he has to translate it into English in his head. And, and that's that's important. And given the fact that they don't have, again, I, I was, con <laughs> actually, when I heard that Jordan was talking with people from Cambridge, I was concerned because I thought the last thing he sort of needs is to sort of get trapped into 
some of the pitfalls of contemporary biblical scholarship. Not, not that contemporary biblical scholarship doesn't offer a lot today. I think it does because I obviously read it um, when I'm when I'm doing my work. But uh, Prager kind of has a nice touch with stuff, and he you know he has a knowledge of Hebrew, so he's he actually is a good addition in my opinion. So that is uh, that is where I come from in this discussion. And I trust you will all defer appropriately to a member of the chosen people. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got a good sense of humor. So I, 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 I enjoyed Prager a lot. I, I have enjoyed him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Stephen Blackwood. Thanks, Jordan. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm now Stephen Blackwood. I looked up his, his Wikipedia account too. Stephen Blackwood's no stranger to the Jordan Peterson channel. He um, has been quite prominent in some of the videos, including Jordan's talk with Roger Scruton, which I thought was was really a wonderful conversation. Um, he's he's Canadian. Um, Blackwood was born in Alberta, Canada, and grew up on Prince Edward Island. Um, he is the eldest of ten children. Was educated at University of King's College, and um, got his PhD at Emory and is founder of Roston College, uh, lectures and writes on intellectual and cultural development of the West, specializing in history of philosophy. So again, someone else who specializes in, um, in well, the history of philosophy, not necessarily philosophy of religion, especially Boethius. Oxford University Press published his work, The Consolation of Boethius as Poetic Liturgy in 2015. So uh, let's see, how old is he? Um, come on, Wikipedia, you're supposed to tell me these things. Born in 75. How old is Peugeot? I don't know. So so 75, another another Xer. I'm Stephen Blackwood. I'm the president of Ralston College in Savannah, Georgia, an effort to revive and reinvent the traditional university. I grew up reading the Bible quite a lot. The I'd say the Bible gave me the primary images through which I came to understand myself and the world, then when I went to university, I sort of stumbled into the discovery of philosophy and literature, especially of the, the Greek and Roman, you might say the backdrop to, to Western culture in the, in the ancient sense. And since then, I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about the relation between that tradition and the biblical tradition and the way in which those uh, are synthesized and in a way in which that synthesis is fundamentally what gives rise to our principles and institutions in the Western world. Um, I suppose I'm particularly excited to be here because I, as others have said, do f profoundly think that we're living in a time in which we've lost the images through which we can make sense of ourselves and of the world in a way that's adequate to, to the, the longings of our own nature. So uh, hopefully we'll, hopefully these images will come to be alive for us and for those who uh, decide to listen to this afterwards. And again, part, part of why I wanted to, I, I initially when I thought about this, well, how would I address this? Well, I'm just going to skip over the introductions. And the more I thought about it, I thought, no, actually these introductions are really key because they, it's a, it's an, it's a portion that people would be very tempted to skip over for exactly the reasons that I thought about skipping them over. But these introductions actually tell you a lot about why they're around the table and what this seminar is about. And again, Blackwood is coming at this saying, the Bible and its images have been foundational and formative for our culture and our society. And the increasing loss of them as let's say controlling and governing images for us is significant. Great. Jonathan Peugeot, another Canadian. That's right. Uh, so I'm Jonathan Peugeot. I am uh, an artist. I don't know that. I don't know that we need to hear Peugeot's. Uh, I think just about everybody on this channel will know quite well who Jonathan is. I, I want to sort of land the plane with this with an, a little bit more contextualization. Those of you, Sunday, I, I meant to release the Tom Holland, Rupert Sheldrake, Mark Vernon, uh, Dominic Sandbrook video on Monday, 
and or I should I should mention the uh, Church of England video on Monday, but I just in Saturday when I was setting it up, I accidentally released it on Sunday instead, so we had sort of a glut of videos on Sunday. But because I listened to that video, um, the algorithm has been setting these up for me, and the algorithm has some smarts to it. And this video, I think, actually bears on why Jordan's biblical series is important. So this, again, is Mark Vernon and Rupert Sheldrake. Sheldrake. Hi, Rupert. Hello, Mark. Rupert, someone pointed out to me that there's a, a sprinkling of figures in the public space who are taking a good look a new look, even becoming Christians, and wonder whether this is significant in some way. Um, it's partly come out of the Jordan Peterson experience, you know, who has very famously raised the subject of Christianity for people and led them to wonder whether there's something in this tradition. But figures like Paul King's North. Martin Shaw, um, and then other figures like, I don't know, Sally Phillips, Mary Harrington. Um, it feels like there's a new look going on at Christianity. And, and the reason why it might be new is that it feels a bit like it's running in parallel with institutional Christianity. Um, so, for example, Martin Shaw and Paul Kingsnorth have turned to Romanian orthodoxy to find a church to go to, which they love for the mystery and the sense of tradition. But also, um, it feels like they're wanting to, well, I think Martin Shaw has even said, rewild Christianity. The idea that actually Christianity in its history is not the rather sort of monocrop Christianity that you get today, very much focused on a particular version of the person of Jesus. Um, and rather wanting to discover other aspects of the figure of Christ, but also saints and stories and places and a kind of the whole rich array of what would have made Christianity, certainly in the medieval world. Um, so, I mean, I wonder whether that sort of makes sense to you. They're, they're partly also, you know, there were books that came out a few years back now, Francis Spufford's book, Unapologetic. Um, which isn't so much wild Christianity, but felt very fresh to a lot of people. Um, and then there's writers like Marilyn Robinson, you know, who too write very freely from their Christian tradition as well. Um, so, you know, it's not, I don't think it's going to reverse the decline of Christianity in the West. I don't think anyone's suggesting that, but it's kind of interesting and, and feels like there's a spirit now, the question of decline, another one of the things on my queue is the negative world, Aaron Wren, because part of part of what I think we're wrestling with is we certainly know that there is there are things in decline, but measuring this sort of thing is is actually quite difficult. And, and Rupert Sheldrake's comments, I think, are, are really helpful coming up here in it that I wanted if you wanted to talk about. Yes, well, I mean, it's a subject I'm very interested in because, um, you know, I myself, after years of being an atheist um, and then exploring spirituality through mainly Indian, but also Sufi traditions, uh, returned to a Christian path. So, um, you know, it's, it's certainly a subject to interest me personally. Um, and I think that, you know, one reason it's happening, it's sort of slightly surprising is, is because there's been this extraordinarily anti-Christian movement, a extraordinarily strong anti-Christian movement among Western intellectuals in general. Um, you know, it, it became, I suppose, by about the 1920s, it became, you know, leading intellectuals like the Bloomsbury Group and, and people of that kind were anti-religious, certainly anti-Christian. And uh, and since then, we, we've found that lots of people who've taken up an interest in spirituality have 
usually adopted the ABC principle, anything but Christian, you know, that where um, it can be Hindu meditation, Zen meditation, Buddhism uh, uh, in sort of diluted forms, um, shamanic drumming, kirtan chanting, um, as long as it's not Christian. And the whole New Age movement really is about spirituality, which is uncoupled from uh, the Christian tradition. Um, so we've had it, uh, and, and the reason for all this uncoupling, I think, is that there, uh, there was a tremendous polemic against Christianity that started in the late 18th century with the anti-clerical movements of the French Revolution and became a standard trope of, of intellectuals, you know, concentrating on the damage the church had done through the Inquisition, the imposition of uh, sort of all sorts of uh, tyrannical rule of uh, at least over people's minds and souls and, and so forth. I mean, kind of historical polemics, um, together with um, the feeling that this was simply incredible. These stories of miracles and so forth are incredible in the scientific age. And Buddhism and Hinduism and meditation seemed more acceptable because they're talking about changes in the mind. They're not so based in uh, historical events. Um, anyway, all of this, I think, led to mass defection from Christianity of Western intellectuals in general, so that in intellectual circles, it simply became impossible or uh, to be a Christian or, or at least difficult or problematic. And I remember when I was uh, for fairly early on in, in my 30s, when I returned to Christianity, I was talking to an eminent scientist and I mentioned the fact that I was a Christian and went to church. And he said, that's unbelievable. I said, I can't believe that any scientist would ever go to church or be a Christian, it's just impossible. So I think that's why it's surprising, because there's been this scorched earth uh, among intellectuals. Um, and most people who take up spirituality are very keen to say they're spiritual, but not religious. So I think what's interesting here is there's a kind of breakthrough, breaking through that prejudice um, to looking at Christianity afresh, as you say, um, looking, returning to it without seeing it through that great curtain of polemic, but rather react, actually responding to it. And I myself find that um, what I respond to very strongly in the Christian tradition is firstly the holy places. I love the cathedrals and churches that we have, especially medieval cathedrals and churches. And I feel they're one of our most underappreciated assets, that they're you know, most people don't go there, most people don't go into them. And yet, there are these places of calm, peace, beauty, uh, which are part of our heritage. And uh, I think it's very important to connect with them, the places. Then the, um, the great choral tradition, as you know, I'm very keen on choral evensong, as you are too, and um, happening every day in our cathedrals. And this wonderful heritage of beauty and music and lovely prayers. Um, a part of why I wanted to bring this up in a little bit, he's going to talk about the Protestant Reformation and books and but but to once again emphasize that Christianity is not simply certain aspects, even though different individuals will pay att attention to different aspects. So for Sheldrake, Sheldrake is emphasizing the buildings, the music, the art and had a little bit of a conversation on one of the live stream chats with an individual who sort of had a bumpy road in the megachurch. But here in North America, where we don't have the kinds of cathedrals and history and, you know, religion in the dripping woods of Saxony, as, as let's say Tom Holland would want to say, there's still a lot of other reasons why people stay Christian or become Christian or maintain interest in Christianity. And, and even in the megachurch, it is the music. Now, it might not be choral evensong. It might be contemporary Christian music. I had to drop my car off to, um, there were some recalls in one of our cars. And so I dropped it off at the dealership and they're going to do those recalls. And they gave me an 
They gave me, put me on an Uber back to church. And it was a Nigerian immigrant to the United States driving a very nice 2019 Jaguar SUV. And he was playing contemporary Christian music on his, um, on the car, on the car radio. He was having a vigorous conversation with someone and he was dropping in all sorts of Christian, um, uh, the writing on the wall and all these little, all these little biblical, all this little biblical language all the way through. Um, we were coming to the church. I said, you can drop me off at the church. He says, oh, I should have, you know, I didn't go to church yesterday. I needed some money. So I decided to go to the casino and I lost $480 there. So I should have gone to church. Religions are massive things. And the individuals around the Exodus Seminar and Jordan Peterson's project of this audacious project, which I'm really looking forward to him getting into the second half of Exodus and then Leviticus of all places. A lot of people don't know that if you think of, if you think of someone like Rob Bell, when Rob Bell began preaching at Mars Hill Church when they took over the Grand Village Mall in Western Michigan, Granville, Michigan. Again, I've got family and plenty of links into Western Michigan because I'm part of the Christian Reform Church. He and this other group spun off and they had this church plant in what used to be the Grand Village Mall in Granville, Michigan. His first sermon series was on Exodus. This is one of the areas in which we're seeing that you don't just escape religion because you decide to go around saying there is no God. Oh, really? Okay. And and part of part of why I called cosmic skeptic obtuse in his video was he's done enough study, he should know better. And when Jordan, you know, in his conversation with Sam Harris. Sam Harris says, well, God is basically a super thing in the sky that you ask um, that you ask for wishes. Dennis Prager has a wonderful section where he talks about the fact that only twice in his life have he, has he ever asked God for anything because it really annoys him that people use God as sort of a cosmic butler. And Religion is so broad and so deep and people engage with it and stay with it in so many ways. And even when they lose their sense of when they are being religious or they think they're not being religious, people are obtuse when it comes to religion. And so th this little this little section in this video I thought was, was really wonderful. You know, and yeah, Mark Vernon and Rupert Sheldrake have... Um, participate and have ideas about Christianity that I know some of my audience will not appreciate. But yet there they are. I want to I want to get to that. Uh, let's see. Let's see where I didn't I only watched this once while I was folding laundry this morning. So I don't have this video particularly well memorized. Then the revival of pilgrimage to Christian holy places uh, is another way in which many people are reconnecting with this tradition. And, and you know, it was it was amazing to me when a friend of mine who teaches sociology at a local university who is very much new age. When he went to Spain to walk the Camino, to essentially do a Christian pilgrimage, and took one of his sons, and his son enjoyed doing that pilgrimage with him. Now, neither of them identify as, as Christian, although his son, both, both my friend and his wife, were deeply new age and um, his, um, his wife, the, the son's mother told me at one point, you know, I, I, I asked all of my children if they could pick sort of a, a favorite avatar or guru or spiritual light. And, um, this particular son picked Jesus. And I, I live in Northern California. Not reconnecting through studying books and, 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 belief systems and spending months on the catechism, uh, but rather reconnecting through experience, through going to these moving services, connecting with these holy places. And I think that what's the, the fact that some people 
who've returned to Christianity uh, go for rather exotic forms of it, like Romanian orthodoxy, um, is because the orthodox tradition has retained this kind of rather mystical element. It's always been more mystically oriented. And also the liturgy there is is very right brain. I mean, the, the translation of the liturgy into the vernacular at the Reformation and then into modern English in the 20th century is very left brain. It's about words, about books, about texts, about interpretation of texts. Whereas if you go to an Orthodox service, it lasts for hours, and all this chanting in languages you don't understand with incense and icons and dim light and stuff, it's very much a right brain experience, as the Roman Catholic services were until they changed to the vernacular. And, and many people who are Roman Catholic you know, are very nostalgic about the pre-Vatican II um, Latin rites. Um, so I think really what this this move back is is driven more by an attraction to the experience, um, uh, the experience of liturgy, the experience of holy places, the experience of pilgrimage, the experience of sacred chant, and less driven by you know, careful study of the Bible, um, Bible classes, um, you know, biblical exegesis, on which Protestant Christianity was so strongly based. So, uh, I... now, now, what's interesting again here is that with the Exodus seminar, it's exactly that sort of focus on the Bible, but it's not the focus on the Bible in the particularly modernist way. And that's key here, because again, as modernity recedes, the, the Exodus seminar is in some ways a liminal space. Uh, Jonathan Peugeot is running, is, is releasing some of his own thoughts on Exodus. I, I haven't decided whether or not I'm going to pull the trigger, trigger on a, this little corner Exodus seminar. Part of me really wants to, um, and we'll have a bunch of people in StreamYard um, talking about the Bible. Um, so those of you who would like to volunteer for such a thing, I have, I have sort of categories in mind of who I'd want around the table. I'd certainly want a skeptic, and I'd certainly want one of our Jewish friends in this little corner, and I'd certainly want someone who's orthodox or orthodox curious or fascinated or moving there and i'm i'm a protestant and maybe we'll uh we'll bring in um we'll bring in some other other people i, I haven't decided if i'm going to do that i would probably have to wait until the new year till after the holidays but uh it would be a lot of fun and and so even though sheldrake is like well the protestant reformation sort of had a a particular perspective on this i see it as a this return of experiential christianity for the kind of people we're talking about. Um, I mean, there are still evangelicals uh, who come to it more from a biblical base. And, and my view is that there are many different ways of approaching this tradition. I, I don't think one's right and the other's wrong. I think that think different ones appeal to different people. And the experiential route certainly appeals to me more. Yeah, that, that makes the and, and even in, let's say, Protestant churches, um, you've got some people who are just really into hardcore Bible study, some people who want to know what the Greek and the Hebrew said. Some people just want to go there and get lost in the praise and worship and have Jesus talk to them directly. Um, read um, uh, Lerman and and her series on religion as she, as she sort of waded into um, some vineyard churches. A lot of sense, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was recently reading a book about the history of belief, and it's very striking after the Reformation in the 16th century how quite quickly, within a decade, being a Christian was determined by your propositional assent. Um, the, the book I was reading, um, it describes how in the 1520s, in about a decade, suddenly in Europe, hundreds of catechisms were printed, you know, after the printing. And now, again, I would think that this is a matter of emphasis because uh, you're not going to have ancient church councils that are debating Christology and the doctrine of the Trinity. And um, it, it's not that they were just 
only into certain aspects, not that they weren't only into belief as such. Um, I mean, creeds, creeds are a lot older than catechisms, but Mark Vernon's point is a good point that with the printing press, things began to shift. Press invention, both on Protestant and then in the Counter-Reformation on Catholic sides. And a kind of anxiety spread quite quickly. Are you making the right intellectual confession in order to secure your salvation? Um, and that was a radical wrench from medieval Christianity, which in the great buildings you describe, and it's, you know, it's very remarkable that there's buildings in a place like England that are up to a thousand years old that are still living buildings. I mean, that is quite something. Um, but, you know, people would have used them not to be um, kind of corralled in ranks, um, paying attention to what was going on up front, um, but rather would have, you know, paid their homage to the shrine, um, doused themselves in holy water, lit candles. Um, you know, the priests were doing whatever the priests were doing in the choir. Um, but a Christian in the medieval world might never have said the words, I believe, um, which is quite surprising partly because they wouldn't have spoken latin and said credo but partly because they weren't expected to um, and so there is something of a sense of kind of return and another area which i wonder whether um is significant is that it feels to me that what might be called the supernatural is quietly becoming more acceptable um i mean i, I was recently reading a couple of books um one called um why woo woo works written by a kind of cognitive scientist saying, look, things like telepathy, things like um, kind of placebos, um, even the sense that there's others into other intelligences, um, you know, which traditionally might have been called angels. Um, the evidence is sort of in for a lot of this now. And it's just um, a kind of knee-jerk reaction that's not accepting that. And moreover, it's funny that he, he sort of flips back into modernity and says, the evidence is in. Well, that's a very modern approach. Most people who are who are into who who are not following the the lines of modernity don't care about the line. <laughs> Which is back to the main point of this little conversation that religion, Christianity has always been a far broader thing than the little boxes that we tend to put it away are in. And that's, and that's part of the reason I'm going to, I'm going to pull it up. That's part of the reason, as in the words of Grim Grizz, this video was so pedantic. Um, God has, we've, we've always struggled to know what we mean by that word. And Christian confession has long said, uh, there, there's more. There's more that we're talking about than we can understand. And another video that I think will get made because I've been wanting to make this video for a little while is going to deal very much with the question of Christianity and history and practice. Working from, if you want to get a jump on it, you can listen to the rest is history episode on Senegal, the second half of that video because it very much gets into human practice um you know you would let, let's say you'd ask abraham abraham do you believe in god that would just be a silly question well um abraham gets up and goes and has faith in this god who who, who, but he wrestles with faith in this God. If you haven't watched my Roman Sunday school class, we've we've talked a lot about that. Can will will this God who shows up in his life and says, "I'm going to make you a great nation. You and your barren wife are going to have a child." Um, he didn't have a catechism or a creed. And again, I'm I I'm a minister of a confessional church. I've got nothing against catechisms and creeds, but I've been a minister long enough to know many of the people that come into your church don't really care that much about the catechism and creed. They care about the practice, they care about the singing, they care about the community, and it becomes all of this axiomatic substructure in their lives as as I said at the beginning of a recent video, part of what happens at church is to form, protect, encourage, stroke, um, 
that though those axiomatic structures upon which people build their lives and the vast majority of people don't do a lot of spelunking into their axiomatic structures and so to get back to the question of let's say this exodus seminar it is in fact a great deal about well let's pick up a flashlight go into the basement and in fact, when we're going into our basement as persons that are not simply defined by the wrapping that our skin is around this biological being born in the early 60s, but the, the depths of Paul Vanderclay and the depths of each of us that go back into our parents and our grandparents and generation after generation, this is what's going on. And, and, to, and to simply sort of dismiss it because Jordan Peterson talks about God and narrative and um, the Bible and history, again, is pedantic. So that should be about enough for now. Um, let me know how this went. So I, I did just, you know, dipped my toe into some of this a little bit. But yeah, let me know.